Do scientific experiments always have a control group? Stay tuned. Hey everybody, today we're talking once again about understanding good principles of experimental design. I know. I'm sure you remember my video on true experiments versus pseudo experiments. Now, if you didn't watch that one, that's okay, but I'll leave a link to it in the description for you just in case you wanted to watch it. Shameless plug. I'll also mention that this isn't my first video on sexy control groups, so I'll leave a link to my other video on proper control groups for classical conditioning experiments below as well. Another shameless plug. Okay, so recently I've had a lot of people asking me about situations in which they're really not sure what their control group is or if they even have one. So let's get into a brief overview of what control groups are, some common types, and some cases in which it might not be clear which group is the control. So back to basics. In an experiment, typically you wanna see whether your independent variable has an impact on your dependent variable. Maybe you wanna see if the independent variable caffeine affects the dependent variable memory. So you decide to give people some caffeine pills, give them one minute to memorize a list of words, and then measure how many words they can recall 15 minutes later. You'll find the average number of words people can recall, but so what? This number is meaningless unless you have something to compare against. So you need a second group, one that doesn't get caffeine, that stays at baseline levels. Now this will help you know how much of an effect, if any, the caffeine had. And this is what people mean by a control group, a condition in an experiment that you compare against to see if your manipulation of the independent variable, like caffeine, had an effect. But some experiments don't compare two separate groups. They may look for a change over time, such as before and after treatment. In this case, the word condition may be better than the word group because you don't really have two separate groups of participants. Instead, you just have one group that you examine under one condition and then the other. Maybe this week I have my participants take caffeine and do the memory task, and next week I have my participants avoid caffeine for 24 hours before doing the memory task as the control condition. Now I'll use the words group and condition interchangeably here, but just know that condition tends to be better for general use. Another thing to consider is that sometimes the comparison is between conditions, but it may not be clear which one is the experimental condition and which one is the control. For example, imagine a study that compares six hours of sleep versus eight hours and 10 hours, and you wanna see if it impacts test-taking ability. Now, you have three groups that all sleep different amounts, but which ones are the experimental group or groups, and which ones are the control groups? Sometimes you're comparing two conditions, but it isn't clear really whether one is a control group or not. Studies of mindset often compare one group in a growth mindset to another group in a fixed mindset. A control group in that situation might be one that doesn't manipulate mindset at all, one way or another, but I'm not aware of any experiments that actually do that, and if you, if you know of one, leave me a link in the comments, please. Between growth and fixed mindset, it is, of course, important to explore the differences between those groups, but neither group is really a control group. In these cases, it is a true experiment, and you can make valid scientific comparisons, but neither group is really a control. It's just comparing one group relative to the other. If you're with me so far, could you take a second to hit the like button? It'll help get this video out to others like you who care about good experimental design. Fight the good fight, people. Let's talk about another situation where you may not know what your control condition should be. For example, if the caffeine group in the experiment I was describing takes a pill and the control group doesn't, this introduces a problem. Maybe it wasn't the caffeine, but the act of taking a pill that made the difference. Placebo effects are real, and just believing the pill will make a difference can sometimes cause changes in behavior. Lots of different experiences can influence behavior. If a scientist studying rats injects one group with drugs, they need to, need to handle and inject the other group with some kind of liquid without the drug, since handling the animals could cause differences in behavior. 
Human participants who watch a video or read an article or write something might behave differently from those who just sit in a chair purely because of that activity, no matter what the video or article was about. That means you often have to find a control condition that closely mimics the experience of the control group, just absent the one thing that you're interested in exploring. An experiment on gratitude might have one group write a thank you letter to get them all gratitude -y? <laughs> But what should the control group do? Should they also write? About what? Something not about gratitude, obviously, but how do we know that the thing that they wrote about didn't have an effect? If they wrote a list of their favorite foods, maybe it would make them feel hungry and therefore might change their behavior. Now that might make it look like uh, when you found a difference between the groups, that the gratitude made a difference when really it was the hunger of the control group. Or maybe writing a thank you letter is emotional and it's the emotion, not the gratitude, that makes the difference. So you can see this gets complicated really fast. Your choice of control group matters a lot. Now here's a real study that explored the positive effects of gratitude. They had participants in the experimental group write a thank you letter with the intention of delivering it in person later that week to the person that they addressed it to. For the control condition, they decided to have a group of participants write about some of the things they did yesterday and how they felt about them. Now, the authors found positive benefits of gratitude in a measure of affect or feelings, much like other studies before them. But notice that the experimental group had to anticipate a social interaction, whereas the control group didn't. How do we know that it was the gratitude and not this social contact that made the difference? In the discussion, they had to address this issue. The authors say, the control group in the current study differed from the gratitude intervention in more ways than just expressing gratitude. For example, social contact. A psychological placebo, however, would ideally be identical to the intervention under study in all ways except the exact strategy being manipulated and tested for efficacy. This, however, is often difficult. Future researchers, they're putting it off on, the, on people in the future to solve this problem, future researchers should consider controlling for positive social contact. Specifically, control groups could be asked to visit their friends, parents, caregivers, or coach and express their emotions to them about school. The control group's task then becomes social and expressive, but the specific emotion is more self-centered, such as pride, than the other-centered nature of gratitude. A critic might argue, a critic, wonder who that was, a critic might argue that some of the differences between conditions went beyond the strategies and techniques. We leave this interpretation up to the reader as researchers continue to refine what works best and for whom in gratitude interventions. <laughs> okay, so that tells me that one of the reviewers really gave them a hard time about this. But I get it that this is a really tough problem to deal with. Now, it is an issue that needs to be explored. The problem is that journal editors and reviewers don't often see this kind of method refinement and figuring out what's the right control group to be very sexy. You know different and I know different, but journal editors, they have weird tastes. So it can be hard to publish studies into this all important area. Ideally, this issue could have been resolved by including multiple control groups in the same experiment or thorough replication with other control conditions, but probably they didn't think about this problem until after they'd done the experiment. Now that's why good experimental design is important on the front end. Finally, sometimes there's an ethical issue with your control groups. Imagine that you're treating people for depression, which as you know, can be a life-threatening condition. Now you're experimental group is going to get your shiny new therapy that you're trying to show works. But what do your control participants experience? Ethically, you can't sit by and give them no treatment at all. Often, researchers solve this problem by comparing new treatments to their old standard treatments, often called treatment as usual, abbreviated TAU. But other names include care as usual or standard care. Now, there are at least two problems with this that come to my mind. First, treatment as usual does not have a standard definition, so it makes it really hard to compare across studies to see whether a treatment works or not. 
Some studies looking at cognitive behavioral therapy versus treatment as usual have run into this problem, showing that there is, quote, significant heterogeneity amongst TAU conditions, and the size of the effect of cognitive behavioral therapy compared to treatment as usual depends on the nature of the treatment as usual condition. In other words, the effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy as a treatment depends on what your definition of treatment as usual is. The second issue here is that the new treatment needs to be better than the current treatment in order to be considered effective. But what if we found a new treatment that was equally effective as our current best treatments, but had fewer side effects and was cheaper and easier to administer? We could get it to more people. Wouldn't that be important to know? If you found this video helpful, hit the like button. It really helps us grow our channel. Subscribe to get more videos on all things psychology. And until next time, keep thinking. People still know who Paris Hilton is, right? And that so hot is her catchphrase? Did she loop back around to famous? Leave a comment. Thank you.